بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء قال الله في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وخلق الجان من مارج من نار Sadaq Allahul Aliyul Azim. The first of you allowed the salawat in honor of the greatest man to walk this earth, Al Habibul Mustafa Muhammad. The second in honor of the greatest lady to walk this earth, Al Hawraul Batulati Fatima. And the third, with your loudest, with your loudest voices, in honor of our Imam, Imam Sahib Al Asri was Zaman. The verse in question from chapter 55 of the Holy Quran discusses the origin of something that, up until the message of Islam, reveal, remains unseen or of the world of the unseen. And ayah 15 comes by saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a specimen or a species by the name of Jan from the flames of fire. And inshallah tonight we'll be discussing this particular aspect of the world of the unseen. First, firstly, because of many people that have come and asked questions regarding the jinn. Many people have questions in the back of their minds regarding the jinn. Many aspects that people have questioned over the years and no one's clarified. Can they or can they not? Or do they or do they not? In many aspects of their life. So inshallah tonight we'll be discussing in particular steps and particular stages. Aspects in which we've handpicked and we've been asked about. To clarify it, inshallah, first and foremost to ourselves, and hopefully we'll have a better understanding of the creation of Allah that dwells on this planet amongst us. And inshallah, first we look at their origin, their name, population. What names are given to different kinds of jinn? What are their predecessors? Who are the original fathers, let's say? Then we'll look, like to look at their particular aspect of sharia. As in, do they have prophets like us? What kind of makeup do they have? Their physical qualities. And after that, we'd like to look at particular encounters between the prophets of Islam and the jinn, particular imams and the jinn. And we'll look at what we can learn from these particular incidents that apply to our life. And after it, we'd like to answer two very important questions. After we've discussed the origin, of these species that live amongst us and on earth, we'd like to ask two important questions that are on the minds of many people that discuss the species known as jinn on this planet. One of which, does jinn or do the jinn have knowledge above that of our knowledge? As in many people think to themselves that the jinn, whenever they're mentioned, they think to themselves that they have knowledge and power much higher than we do. And inshallah we'll discuss the aspect of knowledge. And secondly and most importantly, to conclude the lecture for tonight, we'd like to answer the question, can or cannot the jinn possess a human being? Because the question that comes up whenever jinn is mentioned, or the particular characteristics and traits of someone, you'll find very fearful, very scared to discuss a topic such as jinn. Because the first thing that pops into their mind is that the jinn can possess us. And inshallah we'll like to discuss this in more detail and answer the question, can jinn possess humans or can't they? And inshallah we'll look at logical questions and we'll answer them. And we'll look at Quranic verses 
And by that we'll answer this question also. And we'll look into the world of hadith to see is there anything that alludes to the fact that jinn can or can't possess us. So inshallah to start this very important topic I'd like to say and very broad topic also because there's many aspects that we can discuss but I've chosen a handful of topics to look at during the time restraints that we have tonight so please help me in starting tonight's topic by reciting aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Jinn is, and if we look at it, descendants of a creature by the name of Jan. Just as Beni Adam are the descendants of Adam, in the same manner, the traditions tell us that jinn are offsprings, and the main jinn that was created is known as Jan. Just as we know that the Shayateen are offsprings of Iblis, meaning he is the father of shayateen therefore we begin to analyze that yes there is a father figure there is a first creation and there are offsprings and we find jinn are always associated with that which is hidden or unseen and that's why when we look at other aspects within linguistics we find something that is hidden or unseen also referred to or have a derivative of the root word of jinn as an example someone that's has, or as we, we, we'd like to refer to it as, not have his complete brain functions. We call him, if he doesn't have his full functions, and we refer to him as majnoon, isn't it? Meaning that his presence, or the presence of his brain is no longer there, or no longer functioning. Another example is when we have an infant that's still in the womb of his mother. We often refer to him as janine. Because he's veiled as traditions in three different darknesses. So we find the root word of jinn meaning, and giving the example of being sacred, being veiled, being unseen. And that's what the jinn are. And when we see that the aspect of jinn, even though we know that they live on the planet, if we did not have prophets that came, messages from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would never actually know there's such a thing called jinn in the first place. Because jinn remains in the world of the unseen. And it's very rare that you find instances, especially in the Western society, that someone may encounter jinn in their actual form. And you find there are many different characteristics of jinn, many different types of jinn that we can refer to, just like there's many types of humankind. And there are many jinn, and we will discuss a few of them. As in one of them, if a true essence, if you see a jinn in tradition, in its true essence, in its true form, it's referred to as jinni. And that's the irony when we find that our siblings or our offsprings sometimes get a little naughty and out of control. We like to call them jinni in ourselves, don't we? And we find that's the first aspect. If you find him in its original form, we like to call him jinni. If he lives within the same premises or the same household that jinn is referred to as Amir. If he bothers the children within the household, those jinn are called Arwah. If the jinn is very troublesome and he harms you from time to time, that's why it's referred to as Shaitan. Very troublesome. And then we have the physically elevated jinn known as Afrit, and that's where the Qur'an refers to when talking with Sulaiman when he says bring me or who can bring me the throne of Balqis and the Qur'an states that Afritun min al jinn, isn't it? One that's physically elevated and capable said I'll bring you that throne before you stand or sit from your place, isn't it? And we'll discuss who's in a more elevated rank, humans or jinn, humans or malaika in just a moment, inshallah. So we find in the first instance that yes, jinn has a presence. They have different forms. Their name are derived. We know the original creation and the offsprings. Now let's look at their sharia life. When someone brings forth the question and the argument, do they have different prophets? Do they have different religions? As in their creations, they're sane. They can think for themselves. 
They can work for themselves. The aspect with jinn is that they can live for thousands of years because of their maker. And they created from the flames of fire. Therefore, we know that's attributed to jinn are long lives. And that's why when we have traditions till today, that many of the jinn that were in the 10th of Muharram live up until today. And we'll get to that, inshallah, on an ending note for tonight to see how and why and what we can learn from them. So in aspect, when we look at Sharia law, our traditions tell us that the jinn have their own separate law. Just like we have our separate law. They have own sets of prophets that came and revealed the message of Allah. As you know, Sharia law that we have is occupying of our particular makeup, of our attributes, of our daily lives. What we are capable of, what we are incapable of. Likewise, the jinn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows his creation. He knows that the jinn have particular makeup, have particular attributes. Therefore, they have their separate law, rules and regulations. Now someone asks, is there a prophet of ours? That was a prophet for both jinn and ins. Someone comes and says, well, Sulaiman had control. He ruled both jinn and ins, amongst many other things. And the argument states in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He has made jinn at the service of Sulaiman. Nor did he say that Sulaiman is the prophet for the jinn. Focus on that point. And that's why we have the argument stating that the only prophet that was a prophet sent down by Allah that had the Sharia law for both humans and for jinn was none other than Al-Habib Al-Mustafa Muhammad. And if you look at the beauty of that, the guardian of that message and the safekeepers were the Ahlul Bayt and the Imams after him. And that's why they have, or one of the attributes that they have at a higher rank than the others. When we have them in ranking with the other prophets of Islam, bar our prophets. And inshallah we'll discuss that on the 10th night. The ranks and the importance of the figures that we have and in accordance with Ahlul Bayt. So we find that's another aspect that we have to look at, the Sharia law. So when someone comes and states, will they go to the same hell? Will they go to the same heaven that we do? And it's a very important question to ask ourselves. Now in our traditions, the first and foremost, it states that yes, jinn will also go towards hellfire. Abu Hanif is of the opinion that jinn will not burn in hellfire because they're made from fire. And we discussed, I believe, on the first night, the particular instance where Bahlul has an argument with Abu Hanifa, in which he takes a rock and he throws it at Abu Hanifa's head. Abu Hanifa's in pain, he takes him towards the courtroom, he says, well, you have to prosecute him. The judge says, Bahlul's not necessarily a sane person, how could you want me to prosecute someone that's insane? Or in reference to the topic for tonight, a majnoon. So, uh, so Abu Hanifa tells him, no, it doesn't matter, he's hurt me, you have to prosecute him. And Abu Hanifa had three opinions, one of which was everything's pre predestined. Everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already predestined. Whatever you do, it's not your free will, Allah has already predestined you for to do that. The second opinion that he has had is that everything that exists can be seen. And on the third level, he had the opinion that Iblis will never burn in hellfire because he's made of hellfire. So Bailul disproves all three arguments that he had. Firstly, he says that Abu Hanifa says he can feel pain. And he says anything that exists can be seen. So can Abu Hanifa show me pain? Because if he can't, it means according to Abu Hanifa, pain doesn't exist. That's the first level. The second level he says, well, don't blame me because Allah has already predestined for me to throw that at him. So if you want to prosecute anyone, well, ayyadu billah, you should be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the third level, he says that he has the opinion, Abu Hanifa, that Iblis will never burn in hellfire because he's made of hellfire. He says, I've picked up clay, thrown it at clay, clay got hurt. Meaning that the human is made of clay. And when he gets hurt, that why is it that Iblis doesn't burn in hellfire? 
So that's the three opinions that he had. Bahlul disproves it. So we believe that yes, as a school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt, jinn burn in hellfire. However, do they share the same heaven that we do? That's when the opinions differ. The opinion states, and the majority of opinions state, that there's something, and we read it in the Holy Quran, it says a state and a place of sanctuary. By the name of Al-I'raf. And the jinn that will be rewarded go towards Al-I'raf. In our traditions, it also says that the Shia and the Ahlul Bayt, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, that have sins that will be punished in hellfire. Listen to this carefully. The followers of Ahlul Bayt and the righteous people, that will be prosecuted in hellfire to cleanse themselves of the sins. After they finish from hellfire and are cleansed, they go towards Al-I'raf. And if someone gives them shafa'a, intercession, they go towards heaven. If they do not give them intercession, they will stay at Al-A'raf. So that's in reference to what? Heaven and hell towards the aspect that we're speaking about tonight, which is jinn. Now, the question arises. Are jinn at a higher status than us? Or are we at a higher status? Because someone comes with the argument from the Holy Quran stating that Allah always mentions jinn before he mentions the sons of Adam. As in we have an example, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنِّ نَوَلْ إِلَّا لِيَعْبِدُونِ Isn't it? So he mentions jinn before he mentions humans. So people come and say that no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made them at a higher rank. And the argument states that no. And the biggest statement for this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates Adam, He tells Iblis what? Bow down to Adam. Now the argument states that jinn are narrated in the Holy Quran before ends for two reasons or two opinions. The first opinion states that their numerical value is higher than that of the humans. Some traditions come forth and state that there are up to six jinn for every human on this planet. Now you do the calculation. If we're seven billion on this planet, how much jinn do we have? And that's why it's important to know about the other creatures that dwell within this world with us. And know how to occupy ourselves, how to deal with them, how to segregate them, how to be protected, how to be veiled. So a numerical value is the first opinion. The second opinion is that jinn were created before Adam. And we know that for a fact. Traditions tell us that it's up to 7,000 years jinn were created before the creation of Adam. And even if you don't look at the 7,000 years, we know that Iblis was created before Adam. And Iblis in itself was a jinn. And Iblis worshipped for 6,000 years. So look at how long he was created before Adam. So the two examples that come forth and tell us that that's why the jinn are always mentioned before humans in the Quran. Not necessarily because of their superiority. Now let's look at incurrences between the holy prophets and jinn, between Imam Ali and jinn, between our imams and jinn. What can we learn from it? What can we learn from these aspects in which they came together? The first I want to narrate is a story that we're all familiar with. Because when we're discussing jinn, the world of the unseen, we need to have a firm heart in the belief. And we all know jinn exist. That's firm enough. Now we need to know how our imams interacted with these creatures on the earth. And we know the very, very famous tradition when Ali ibn Abi Talib was Khalifa. And he says a speech in Masjid al-Kufa, and the narration states that there was a Tha'ban. As we like to look at it, if you want to close in the picture, a serpent or a large snake comes from the corner of the Masjid. And everyone is scared. And everyone goes to try to kill it. And Ali ibn Abi Talib states, he says, leave it, for it has been ordained to come. So everyone's thinking, what's going on? The serpent comes 
And the beauty about this tradition, and why I narrate this first, is that it's not only found within our books, no. It's within all books in Islamic history that this incident occurs. So the serpent comes, and it comes towards Ali ibn Abi Talib's ease. And the tradition says it begins hissing, and Ali ibn Abi Talib begins talking with it. And it takes itself and leaves the mosque unharmed. So the people are very amazed at what just occurred, as a serpent just talked towards the Khalifa of the time. So they begin to ask Ali ibn Abi Talib, can you explain further what exactly just happened? And Ali ibn Abi Talib replies by saying, and this is the greatest example that we have, saying that the Prophet was the Prophet for both jinn and for ins, and that the Imams after him carried this message on. He says, this was the son of my wasi on the jinn. He's come to tell me that his father has passed away. And he's asked me, what have, will you have me do? Would you like to appoint someone new? Would you like to come and solve this argument? And Ali ibn Abi Talib replies to him to say that you are now my, after your father, wasi on the jinn. And after I gave him that authority, he left the mosque. And the beauty about this is that it's not just narrated in our books, and that's what I stated earlier. But people always put a blind eye to narrations such as these when discussing the magnanimous nature of knowledge when Ali ibn Abi Talib is mentioned. Another tradition also, I'm going to first talk about traditions in all books, then I want to go to our books. Another tradition, and this one's found within the other school of thought and in our books as well. Namely, if you want to look at this particular tradition from our books, you go open up Ma'ajiz Ali ibn Abi Talib or Ma'ajiz Imam Ali by Sayyid al-Bahrani and you go to page 54 and it's narrated there. Saying it's not just from our books, from the books of other brothers in religion. It states that the Prophet of Islam was inside the mosque and there was a jinn alongside him. Remember, not just our books, but look at this narration. It will drive you insane, I guarantee it. Because it, we cannot comprehend this in any faculty unless you take out the aspect of time and space. That's the only way you can look at it. So the jinn, as soon as Ali ibn Abi Talib enters, he disperses. And we'll look at their physicality very, very shortly. He disperses. Ali ibn Talib leaves. He reappears. So the Prophet asks him. Remember, not just in our books. Prophet asks him. He says, why is it that you disappeared? And as Ali ibn Talib left, you reappeared. He says, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. He says, what is it? Tell me. He says, I am from the jinn that fought against Prophet Sulaiman. He says, Allah, remember, not our books. He says, Allah created an angel. If it's not a mirror reflection of that man, then I'll be a liar. He says, it's a mirror reflection of that man that just entered. And I feed for my life. Then I dispersed and I reappeared when he left. I think for that we need a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. يا علي بعث مع الأنبياء سرا ومعي جهرا Prophet of Islam You have been revealed with the prophets in secrecy and with me out in the open And when we find Abu Hamza al-Thumali gives us a tradition in which he enters or waits outside Imam al-Baqir's house and he finds particular people that were veiled Leave the Imam's presence. So Abu Hamza Thumali comes in towards Imam Bakr and begins to tell him, Imam, you have to be careful who you let in and out of your presence. The Umayyads have a very close eye on you. So you have to be careful of who enters 
and who exits from this domain in which the Imam replies, and look at the beauty of this reply, to show you that there's not just lovers and followers of Ahlul Bayt, they are actually Shia in the jinn. He says, don't worry Abu Hamza, these are our Shia from the jinn. They've come to ask me about the depths of their religion and I have answered their questions. Again, Prophet brings them two together and the person that looks and caters after the message is the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, isn't it? The famous story of Arfata. Arfata is the name attributed to, towards a jinn that came from a particular valley. Arfata comes, veiled. He comes to the majlis of Rasulullah in the presence of his companions. And he says, O oh Prophet of Allah, I have come to seek your assistance and I need someone to come as a judge. He says, what's the problem? He says, we used to listen to whispers from time to time. And when we listen to these whispers, we found that yes, finally the message of Allah, the messenger of Allah has come. And when we listened to these whispers, we believed. And from that time we became Muslims. And we became believers in your religion. However, from our tribe, from our village, we found that people opposed us because we've come into this religion. People stop the water from us, the sustenance from us. So I've come to you to seek assistance and a judge in which can assist us against these people. So the tradition says that the Prophet of Islam firstly says towards Arfata. He says, can you unmask yourself? And this is one of the traditions that we have to give us an insight of what a jinn actually looks like. So the tradition says he unveiled himself. He says the tradition that his face took the, his eyes took the majority of his face. His nose was very minimal on his face and he has very sharp teeth. Overall, something that would be very unpleasing to see and very scary, if we want to put it in our terms. After he veiled himself, he looks towards his side and he says to the first Khalifa Abu Bakr, he says, will you go towards the jinn? And become a judge between them. Now Bakr says, me, jinn? <laughs> what do you mean? Rasulullah, please. No. Anything about this. So he turns, as the tradition says, to Umar, the second Khalifa. He says, will you go and be the judge between them? Umar says, anything but the jinn, O Rasulullah. Give me someone that's handcuffed, tell me to hit his head, behead him for something he's done, I'll do it without a shadow of doubt. But jinn, <laughs> it's not for me, Rasulullah. So he says, Aliya, Aliya bi Abel Hassan. Go find me Abel Hassan. There's no one for this except him. So they bring forth Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Prophet looks at him and says, will you go become the judge? I'm a it's not a problem. So the tradition says that Ali ibn Abi Talib goes with Arfata. And he's accompanied by Salman al muhammadi and a person by the name of Abu Sa'id al-Khidri. And when he goes into a valley, Ali ibn Talib looks back and tells Salman Abu Sa'id, that's it, you can go back now. I'll take it from here. So the tradition states that Ali ibn Abi Talib goes in the morning, doesn't come back. Dhuhr doesn't come back. Asr doesn't come back. So the people begin to whisper, they say, you know what, the jinn, they've tricked Rasulullah, they've taken his companion and killed him. In which Ali ibn Abi Talib returns and the tradition tells us that Sayfuhu yaqtur dama, meaning what? Meaning his sword that was by his side was dripping and drenched in blood. Arfata comes, he says, O Prophet of Islam, this is Ali, my amana, I've brought him back to you. I've done my wajib. I'm going now. So the Prophet looks at Ali ibn Abi Talib and says, can you explain to me what exactly happened? He says, I went, I found that these jinn have yes, stopped the water, stopped the sustenance from the people that came towards the religion of Islam. He says, what did you do? He says, first and foremost, I told them that become Muslim and I gave them the hujjah. This is Islam. Why do you not become Muslim? So they opposed. He says, what then did you do? He says, secondly, I told them, pay the jizya. You may live within our societies, just pay this small tax. 
and they didn't allow it. This is on the third level. I told them at least be kind, live in peace within the jinn that have come towards Islam and they didn't allow that either. And after that, he says, therefore, after I've given them those three points, I went with them in a battle in which I killed a large quantity and the remainder all came towards the religion of Islam. And there's many other traditions that I'd love to have narrated to you. But for the time restraints, we'd have to quickly run towards the aspect and the concept of possession for tonight. Which the question that alludes to us is, can or can't jinn possess us? Now the first argument that takes place in a logical perspective is if jinn can possess humans. Because many a times when we look at the YouTube clips, we look at particular let's say TV channels that are not from Ahlul Bayt's ideology, we find that there's someone lying down on a bed and you find them in a state in which they're possessed, as we can say, and we find there's this scholar that's reading and reading and making all different rituals and the person looks like he's possessed by a demon or something of that sort. And we find many movies that allude to this. Over the time, many horror movies allude to that someone that's possessed by the devil, someone that's possessed by jinn. Paranormal activity, for example. The Exorcist. Many other movies that have come forth to analyze the aspect of possession. How true is this? The first aspect that comes into question, if a jinn, logically speaking, if a jinn can possess you, where then does the balance lie about thawab and aqab? If a jinn possessed you, you can easily come on the day of judgment and say, well, it wasn't me that did this particular crime. Come in a courtroom, well, it wasn't me that did this particular crime. I didn't kill this person, I was possessed. I didn't do this particular atrocity, I was possessed. I didn't steal, I didn't kill. And the list goes on. So a logical perspective would tell you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never allow a jinn to possess you. Then how can a jinn affect you? Now we know when we read Surah An-Nas, nas Malik nas Ilah nas Min Sharril Waswas al Khannas. Whispering can have such an effect on you magnanimous effect in which it may elude you to seeing that which is good as being bad and that which is bad as being good so it has a major effect and that's why Allah chose to say it in the Holy Quran whispers second it can affect you in a manner in which can remove two husband and wife from one another alludes to them and on the third level, it may allow you to make hatred or have hatred towards your heart from the other spouse. So these are three effects. When the aspect of possession, let's look at it in more context. The first aspect of possession. When you look into detail, you find that these people that are always seemingly possessed are more so never male. They're always female appearing on the shows. And when you look into their lives, you find that these females either are suffering from a particular death and their nerves are very deteriorated. Suffering because they're in a state after pregnancy. That's when the Ahlul Bayt say, make sure that when a, when a woman has given birth, you stay with them for 40 days because they're not normal. They are very emotionally unstable. They have just gone through something of a miracle and their hormones are going upside down. So be with them. You find that always the people that are arguably possessed on these screens and the people, they don't even know what they're doing. They say, no, cut this, kill this particular bird, throw blood here. Other person says, well, recite this, put this under your bed. They have no idea what they're doing in the first place. And you find the one common thing that they all do is, re is recite verses from the Holy Quran. Why? Because when a person is arguably what they think as being in a state of possession, which is not possession. It's a state in which their nerves have become broken down to such a level that they begin to rethink, are they or are they not themselves? And they go to people that tell them that yes, you're possessed. 
The only thing that these people all have in common and recite is the Holy Quran. What does the Holy Quran state? Ala It is when Allah has mentioned that it gives your heart and your body salvation and serenity. You are at a state of ease and comfort whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned. And that's why you find these people that go towards these people that pay big dollars to recite verses from the Holy Quran on them, not knowing what they're doing in the first place. They come again and again. And the person recites again from the Holy Quran. Therefore, the traditions tell us that, you know what, if you have nerves that have broken down, go and eat and nutrition that will strengthen your nerves, such as za'faran, one of the strongest for your nerves, qara, strongest for your nerves, lahana, cauliflower, strengthens the nerves, and the ahl bayt give you how to veil the jinn. And I'm trying to conclude as fast as I can because I've already gone over time. Things that you can do to veil yourself, to protect yourself. Number one, ayatul kursi. Writing and having as a possession in your houses and in your premises. Number one. Number two, Imam Sadiq tells someone, as he says, I have an amir. And we discussed the amir is what? A person that is a jinn that occupies in the same premises. He says, as soon as you get two pigeons inside the house, not outside, don't misquote me, inside the house, get two pigeons, and that will draw away the jinn. Get two roosters outside, draws away the jinn. And the repetition of reciting the words, Bismillah. And the words of the Holy Quran drives them insane. Drives them insane. Gets them away. And that's the beauty when our Ahl al-Bayt tell us time and time again, whenever you do anything, say Bismillah. You go out, say Bismillah. If there's a jinn there, if you're about to kill an animal, if you're about to throw hot water outside, when you say Bismillah, it alerts the jinn. Sort of like when you're out in the roads and a car just horns to you, alluding you that, you know what, I'm coming, make sure that you just get out of the way. If you're going to hunt a jinn, because the jinn takes different forms, such as pigs, such as dogs, such as snakes. So when you're hunting, when you say Bismillah, it says if it's a jinn, it will disappear. You won't see it anymore. Because there's traditions that allude to us that if you kill a jinn with that Jinn will come and they may have an effect on your family because you've just killed one of theirs. That's why you should say Bismillah in all your actions to veil you not only from any jinn and even from shayateen this goes for. So that's one aspect. And I'm trying to paraphrase as, as much as I can and I want to allude to the fact on the 10th of Muharram. Was there or was there not any jinn? Because we know that there's jinn that's Muslims. There's jinn that follow the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt. Yes, they were. When Imam was migrating from Mecca towards Medina, we find Aqwam as an ocean state. Aqwamun min al jinn come towards Imam and tell him, Let us finish them for you. Let us finish them for you. And the Imam replies, This is not a battle for the jinn. I know you can. He says, This battle, I know what it's for, why Allah has prescribed it. And what effect it will have till the end of time. Therefore, there is no need for your assistance. I'll take control from here. And that's why we find even till today, there's narrations by our ulama stating that they've recited on pulpits where they can't see anyone in the crowd, yet they hear buka. And when they get down and ask the owner, who is it that was crying? I did see no one when I was reciting the majlis. The reply would come stating that these are jinn that were there on the 10th of Muharram. They cried for aspects that you've stated that were true. Stuff that you've stated that didn't occur or have been twisted. They didn't cry because they know truly and surely what's happened on the 10th of Muharram. So we pray to Allah on that instance. I'm getting signals. We pray to Allah on that instance that we may gain from this knowledge and veil ourselves first and foremost. And insha'Allah we'll have gained this little bit of insight into 
people that dwell or jinn that dwell this earth and live amongst us and how to think around them, how to think with them, how to act and react and how to veil ourselves. And inshallah, this will be beneficial for us, especially in the aspect that knowing that there's no such thing within our books as possession, nor in the Quran, nor in the hadiths. However, it's only a money-making game that people have alluded to, to make their bank balances a lot higher. So we pray to Allah on that night, on this night, to elevate us in knowledge, to allow us to apply the knowledge that He has given us, to allow us to die on the path of Ahlul Bayt, and to allow us to fight alongside Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman with a Surah Al Mubarakat Al Fatiha. But before it, three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Yes. <laughs>